Good, oh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome. We, we, we really should start. We have a very busy program. Hi, my name is Didier Velo. I'm from EFSA. Hi, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Katia Tsayun. I'm from EBTC, Evidence-Based Toxicology Collaboration at Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health. Welcome. Before we give uh, an introduction of, of what we expect out of this day, I would like to uh, inform you with some housekeeping rules. Uh, the first rule is, should be, doesn't work. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh. okay. I know it by heart. The first uh, housekeeping rule is please turn off your phone, the sound of your phone. <laughs> Can uh, somebody switch your phone to silent mode? There it is, yes. But don't turn it off because uh, this is a paperless event. So um, please stay online, stay online to, to, to follow the briefing notes also. Everything is published online. The password uh, is hotel and the username is trip. So if you really, if you go into trip hotel, the Wi-Fi, then you have to give this username and password to be able to follow everything also online. In case there's any more question, please <laughs> refer to the staff at the information desk. And we really, and want you to be engaged in this whole uh, conference. So please, in case you have any questions, comments, suggestions, don't only ask it also, and don't bring it to us, but also tweet it. Use the hashtags EFSA EBTC and evidence integration. Please, we, we invite you to, to engage with us and to ask your, uh, your questions uh, via Twitter also. And this is not only people in the public, of course, but also people who follow us uh, during the web stream. So let me say a few words uh, about EFSA. So EFSA, as the risk assessment agency of the European Union, provides decision support to the risk management in the areas of food and feed safety, animal health, animal welfare, and plant health and nutrition. So as described thoroughly in the online briefing, uh, notes we follow for this a transparent framework of identifying, searching and collecting, appraising and integrating the evidence needs in order to come to a fit for purpose outcome that serves the risk manager in order to make its uh, decision given the time available and resources available. So today, as you are all knowing, we are focusing on the evidence integration part where we combine at different levels the already appraised evidence streams, taking into account the uncertainty which um, was explored and assessed during the appraisal phase. In the briefing notes, you can find links to specific cross-sectional guidances that we use for this, and also a link to the framework on how we deal with evidence use in our risk assessment. So together with you all, we want to explore the further challenges that are in the evidence integration step. And during the morning, and in order to trigger our neurons, our, our speakers will bring uh, forward their views and their experience in this area, uh, which and, and the roots of those speakers is not necessarily in food and feed safety assessment or even in toxicology. So, so this is really to, to trigger your neurons. Because in the afternoon, under the guidance of the chairs of the breakout groups, it will be up to you. We want your ideas. We want your um, views. We want your constructive criticism. We, Beth, we want your engagement. We want to pick your brain. We want to share the knowledge. We want to use this knowledge also, and we want to learn from it and build further on it in order to progress in our journey in the evolution of this critical step of the risk assessment process. And we will publish also the outcome of these discussions online and it will be available for everybody. I say we, because this is a joint colloquium with the evidence-based toxicology, toxicology cooperation, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> and hereby I give the floor to Katya to introduce what EBTC is standing for. Great, thank you very much, Didier, and uh, I'm delighted to be here and welcome you with, uh, with EFSA and introduce uh, EBTC. Uh, so EBTC, if you're, if you're not familiar with this, it's uh, an international collaboration of science, uh, regulatory, and industry leaders that is formed uh, uh, quite a few years ago already at uh, Johns Hopkins to establish and coordinate evidence-based transparent objective 
um, methods of safety assessment to improve, uh, with the goal to improve uh, risk assessment standards for regulatory decision making. That could be used for other purposes, but one of the primary reasons is regulatory decision making. Um, our vision is to uh, that evidence-based toxicology is the standard used to ensure public health, a healthy environment, and a sustainable future. So our mission really is to bring together the international community to facilitate the use of evidence-based uh, methods in toxicology and safety and risk assessment. So we are really delighted here at this uh, partnership with, uh, with AFSA and uh, participation in this colloquium. So there's a funding uh, statement. Uh, we're funded by one of the major donors of Johns Hopkins and uh, have a small grant also from Beagle Freedom uh, Foundation. So uh, this is a, a brief history of evidence-based toxicology. So it's really started uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, over 10 years ago now from uh, uh, with a number of uh, papers about evidence-based toxicology as a foundation. And uh, um, a number of fundamental papers were written by uh, Dr. Thomas Harton, uh, the founder of uh, evidence-based toxicology field. And uh, his graduate student at the time, uh, Sebastian, uh, Dr. Sebastian Hoffman, who is also participating in the, in the colloquium. So the first international forum towards evidence-based toxicology was in, in Cuomo uh, in 2007, or already 10 years ago. So we're celebrating 10 years of this field. Uh, that uh, uh, w there were over 200 people that participated in that uh, colloquium, and many of those uh, folks are on the Scientific Advisory Council of EBTC or on the board, so still participating in this, and the field keeps going. So we are delighted to hear that. So the there was a session on EBT, uh, then following that, again organized by uh, Dr. Hartung in 2008. Uh, and then finally, in uh, uh, at a Society of Toxicology meeting in 2011, there was a official EBTC uh, evidence-based toxicology collaboration kickoff. Uh, there were a number of uh, workshops. There was uh, one in uh, 2014 um, that uh, uh, after which uh, uh, the publication was, uh, was published in toxicolog Toxicological Sciences. Uh, and uh, in 2015, uh, there was a fundamental change in the structure of the, uh, of the collaboration with the formation of independent board of trustees and scientific advisory council. Uh, there were a couple of papers that were published uh, on uh, emergence of systematic review in toxicology, which was following, uh, following up on that uh, workshop at uh, Johns Hopkins in uh, 2014. And another one is a guidance on assessing methodological uh, quality of toxicologically relevant studies, um, a scoping review that was published uh, also in 2016. Then there were four new uh, working groups formed in 2016. And finally, um, the primer on evidence-based uh, toxicology, uh, on, uh, on systematic reviews in toxicology that was published uh, at, the end of, uh, in the, at the end of May this year. And we're now here at uh, at the colloquium. So I just wanted to uh, recognize the founder of evidence-based toxicology field, Dr. Hartung, who is uh, here. Um, so he is a director of Central Alternatives for uh, animal, uh, uh, animal Testing, to Animal Testing at uh, uh, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. And he's uh, an endowed chair of evidence-based toxicology at, uh, at the school. So this is the structure of evidence-based toxicology collaboration. So we have a board of uh, trustees that's now 11 uh, people and uh, representing uh, people from, uh, from different sectors. We're, we are striving to achieve diversity of the, of the board members. We also have a very diverse uh, scientific advisory council with uh, many people representing different areas of uh, science and regulatory and uh, NGO community. And we do our work in uh, working groups. We have a website. You're welcome to uh, take a look closer at what we do and join our working groups. So uh, Dr. Uh, Jack Fowl is, uh, is the president uh, of our board, and these are the members of our board. Um, just recently uh, joined two, uh, two folks from, uh, again, regulatory agencies, uh, the, uh, Susie Fitzpatrick from uh, FDA and uh, uh, Chris Thayer from uh, EPA, who is going to be one of the speakers in the first session. So uh, I guess you, you, we don't really have to uh, tell you why we have to have external board and external advisors, because we are really a collaboration. We're trying to uh, 
take the input from uh, all of our stakeholders to develop methods that are appropriate for use for multiple, uh, multiple industries. So this is our scientific advisory council that we have a couple of folks from uh, EFSA, Elisa is, uh, is on our scientific advisory council. And um, so these are the, uh, the working groups that we have. Um, so we are doing a couple of systematic reviews in this field, focused on test methods comparison, zebra fish embryo toxicity test, and comparison with, um, uh, with the rat and rabbit OECD guideline uh, studies. The evaluation of uh, in vitro uh, EPA TOXCAS, TOX21 assays in comparison with the human adverse outcome uh, in the uh, liver. And uh, a couple of uh, working groups that are uh, risk on the risk of bias and quality of in vitro studies that we, uh, we have recently started, um, headed up by Dr. Uh, Rob DeVries and uh, Paul Whaley. And uh, communication working group that actually uh, Dr. Wyckoff uh, has been a big part of uh, putting together this colloquium that's part of our, our communication work group. So that's, uh, that's it. And again, uh, thank you so much uh, for attending this symposium. I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be very exciting. So with this, uh, I'm going to introduce the, the first uh, session this, uh, this morning. It's going to be focused on hazard identification the second part of the session after the coffee break, it's going to be on uh, mostly on hazard ca characterization and using exposure, integrating exposure into uh, hazard, uh, hazard characterization. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Donald Rubin. Um, professor uh, <coughs> uh, Rubin is a John Lee Professor of Statistics at Harvard University, uh, where he has been a professor since 1983 and department chair for 13 of those years. He has been elected to be uh, a fellow member, honorary uh, member of the Woodrow Wilson Society, Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, American Statistical Association, and many other societies that are too numerous to mention. Uh, and finally, he is a member of US National Academy of Sciences. As of 2017, he has authored and co-authored over 400 publications, including 10 books, has four joint patents, and for many years has been one of the most highly cited authors in the world, with currently over 200,000 citations and nearly 20,000 in 2016 alone. He has received honorary doctorate degrees from Otto Friedrich University, Bamberg, Germany, University of Ljubljana, Slovenia, and uh, many others. So it's a pleasure, pleasure to welcome you, Dr. Rubin. It's a pleasure to be here, and, uh, and I thank uh, the organizers for inviting me. Uh, this is the third time I've, uh, I've been in uh, Lisbon, although not for maybe 10 or 15 years, and it's a really a beautiful city and beautiful time to be here, so I, I really appreciate this. Uh, in some ways, this introductory talk will, will try to fill in a little bit of history that uh, wasn't described uh, in the introduction. Uh, but, but also I s I'm throwing out ideas that I think may, may be uh, uh, useful. I'm, I'm not a toxicologist. I've done some stuff that may be considered related to, to uh, toxicology, but I'm certainly not a toxicologist. And I certainly hope that nevertheless, what I have to say is interesting. So do I, do I know how to use this? Let's see. Do I point it somewhere? Oh, I can, ask, can I go up and down here? Yeah. Sure, that's fine. Okay. Uh, uh, in, in, in all fields of science, I think the evidence comes from many sources that vary in critical ways. Uh, obviously, at some point, we want to apply the evidence to human beings, but a lot of the basic evidence comes from, from studies that can't be, can't be the, the treatments that can't be applied to, to human beings because of ethical reasons and, and other reasons. Um, causal exposures differ. The outcome variables change from, from study to study. Certainly, the settings change. Are they in labs? Are they in cities? Are the city, uh, is it urban, rural? The units themselves, are they families, individuals, or uh, towns, in, in fact? And the characteristics of the units being studied, the units in the experimental design context, I'm describing units here, are they male, female? Are they uh, black, white? Are they wealthy, poor? Uh, 
a body mass index, how they adults, children. I'll try to give uh, some examples that I've been involved in over the years uh, in, in studies like this. Skip forward here. So examples from my experience. <clears throat> uh, years ago, uh, I was in, in involved with some, some studies for the US military. This is during, during the Gulf Wars, an anthrax vaccine. And, uh, and, the, and these studies are kind of interesting because they're not only how to deliver the vaccine, how to vaccinate people, uh, but the dose to, to be vaccinated and the timing of boosters. In fact, the original studies on anthrax vaccine were done in the late uh, uh, 1950s uh, in the US when it was known as wool workers disease uh, because they you get the spores of anthrax in the, in the wool of animals and when you're manufacturing wool, you're beating the, uh, the wool and that releases the electrostatic forces that, that create bonding be between uh, the spores. And the spores, when they're, when they're bonded together in, in clusters, are too large to pass through the nasal passages, so they get trapped. But uh, you weaponize anthrax by breaking these electrostatic forces. I think they're two microns in, in diameter. So in doing these, the, these studies, uh, they, they were not only gonna change the, the dose, but the, uh, the number of booster shots. And so when, when doing these studies, they did some randomized experiments with, with human beings uh, who were volu volunteers, but the outcome variable that everybody ca cared about was surviving a lethal dose of anthrax. And it wasn't considered polite to take people who were randomly assigned to placebo to be exposed to, I think it was 50 times the lethal dose of anthrax. It's not, it's not con considered uh, good, good practice. So they had to do something else. <coughs> And I think well, one of the ideas here was actually uh, kind, of, kind of clever, but it didn't turn out to work very well. But you did experiments. You did randomized experiments with, with lots of animals, with uh, guinea pigs, uh, macaques, rhesus monkeys, and another kind of monkey whose name I don't remember. Uh, but then you also did randomized experiments with, with human beings. Uh, and the idea was to try to, when you're doing these randomized experiments, you, you measure, um, immunogenicity, which is an antibody level to the, uh, to the spores. And what you, what you then uh, try to do is build models in the human beings between the way you did the dosing, the way you did the boosters and number of both in, in a randomized placebo controlled trial and, and the immunogenicity, the antibody level in the blood. You did the same thing in the animals and, and then what you try to do is say, okay, there's a relationship between the, the way I'm doing the dosing, which is try to be parallel in humans and macaques, for example. And then what you, what you try to do is see in the macaques what the relationship is between immunogenicity and survival. So you, quote, you, you challenge the macaques, you wipe them out, and you see you know, with, with the survival rate, how, how, that, how survival rate varies with uh, uh, immunogenicity. So these studies were done with people, non-human primates, guinea pigs, rats, and obviously as you got lower in, in, the, in the food chain, you could be more aggressive with respect to uh, uh, challenging them, killing them. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, non-human primates were the most expensive units because you, ha you had to not only buy them but you had to keep them alive for the rest of their life if, if they survived, Where, whereas the human beings were all volunteers. Uh, another example is a, uh, an anti-epileptic drug that was, that was being proposed for uh, F Food and Drug Administration in, in the US about, about uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and th the interesting thing at, at, at this study is should this drug be approved for kids for monotherapy. That's for being used as the, as the only epileptic drug they're, they're being taken. Uh, and animal studies had been done with both adjunctive therapy and monotherapy. Adjunctive means you're taking another anti-epileptic drug that already had been approved. Uh, and in, in adults, you had both kinds of studies. Because adults who were epileptic could volunteer and say, okay, take me off my, my normal epileptic drug, 
and I'll take a placebo instead, or, or maybe I'll be on this new active drug, and I'll see how many epileptic seizures I, I have. It was considered un unethical to randomize kids because the parents would make the decision whether they'd be participate in the study or not. The interesting thing about, about these studies is, again, it sort of relates to, to the underlying science. You're trying to get lots of cells. And here, the, the, the critical cells were adults, children, monotherapy, adjunctive therapy. And you had three of the four cells. And then what you try to do is, it, since it's unethical to, to randomize the experiment in one of the cells, kids on monotherapy, what could you learn from the other cells where you had randomized experiments? And in, and in fact, there were some uh, pharmaco uh, kinetic pharmacodynamic models that were, that were done. It has to do with mediation and, and the proper way to think about mediation, which maybe will be a topic we'll talk about later. Uh, but in fact, this, the drug was approved for kids with no randomized experiments. This is one of the few examples at, at, at FDA where they actually approved drugs with, with no ex uh, randomized experiments. And there are many other e application areas where, th where these ideas work. Uh, these are ones that I brought up first because I think they're probably more closely related to the toxicology kind of examples that, that you folks worry about. Uh, but for many years, I've worried about social science meta-analyses. Uh, and many of these, these articles that I wrote were with my uh, uh, co-author, Robert Rosenthal. That's the RR there. That, that, that's what, what that refers to. And uh, I've always felt that being quantitative helps focus the discussion. It's not that it's necessarily giving you the right answer or, or, or a great answer, but at least you, you have objective reasons for obje uh, not agreeing with something or questioning something. And so that, that's what, sort of what, what the focus of, of, of this presentation is about. So how do you be quantitative about this? Now, sometimes this effort is termed meta-analysis, and I saw in, in several of the materials that were exchanged earlier that there was a d discussion of uh, meta-analysis and that term. I'm not sure how many people know its, its origins. Uh, the term meta-analysis is due to a, a guy named Gene Glass who wrote it, used it in a 1976 article. So in that sense, the, the history didn't quite start in 1985 or something like that. It goes back from, for many years. And Gene Glass, who is a psychologist who's, who's worrying about uh, psychotherapy, do different modes of psychotherapy really work or not? <coughs> um, and uh, so the, in, in psychology and social science, sort of meta-analysis was kind of a hot topic in the late 70s because of Gene Glass's work and in, in the 80s. And one, one question that, that uh, arose, should meta-analysis, should the summarizing of all the studies that have been done be viewed as s surveying and summarizing the state of the current literature on a relatively homogeneous topic? And I think in the, uh, in the 70s and 80s, that's what the idea was. You have a bunch of papers or articles, published articles, some randomized experiments, some observational studies, some high quality, some low quality, and you try to summarize what the current state of knowledge is by summarizing the literature. And I thought that was the wrong way to think about it. And I think I, I was much closer to should it be building and extrapolating a response surface for the science of the topic. I, I, because of my PhD advisor, Bill Cochran, who wrote our, uh, 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 books on experimental design, I was very familiar with experimental design approaches, and I think that it, it should be viewed more as these are examples of studies that have been done in trying to uh, understand a big response surface where, where the factors that are chosen by current, lit by current writers are just sort of curiosities. That's not the science. Now, it turns out that the former, that's uh, current state of the literature, is much more common approach and also much easier than, the, than building a response surface. Because to build a response surface, you have to uh, delineate between uh, factors that you think are important and factors that are just design factors and choices of people being, being made. Whereas summarizing the, the literature, you just have some criteria for accepting or not uh, uh, articles. But I think the response surface uh, attitude is is a better approach because it's more relevant for science, what I mean is understanding what's really going on, and more relevant for assessing possible interventions. And that's what policy people are supposed to be doing, supposed to be thinking about possible interventions to recommend. And if you're talking about policy, you believe you're doing causal inference. It's gotta be. Say, if I do this, then something will change. 
and it'll change in one direction or, or the other. And so this uh, response service attitude is important for policy, whereas the literature summary is not really important for policy, except very indirectly if they think that the studies being done represent the response surface. And my views on this have remained relatively constant since proposing this response surface attitude in 1986 at a National Academy of Science meeting, actually it was in Virginia, or West Virginia, some, somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and so I, th I, th I think that, that this idea is the right way to uh, think about uh, the science of, of combining piece of evidence. It's not just summarizing the literature on the topic, but it's trying to understand the underlying science. And here's a review that, um, there was a book that, that came out of this conference called The Future of Meta-Analysis by, by Wachter and Straff, published in 1990. And, and this was a, a, a book review that was uh, uh, written in the Journal of the American Statistical Association in 1991 by Gene Glass. I think it's, it's, it's interesting uh, be, because I think it, that, that Gene Glass, who obviously had thought a lot about this over the years and proposed the, the term meta-analysis, uh, is, is a good guy to talk about what the, what the term should mean. I think people who coined the terms and make up the words get to sort of meet, define what they mean. So here's, here's what he wrote. But the chapter that truly speaks to the future of meta-analysis and not to its distant and recent past is a chapter by me entitled A New Perspective. And this is Gene's, Gene's words. It is easily put into words. Meta-analysis should be conceptualized as building response services, not as surveying the literature. The literature published or not on any topic is a huge unbalanced survey. Describing the statistically can result in little more than a description of the research customs and habits. Rubin directs our attention away from the literature and towards the scientific understanding of the phenomenon. Rubin's chapter, the sort of advice that I should have liked to have written. So basically he's saying, yeah, we, that's what we should be doing. We shouldn't just be summarizing the literature. And I still think there's too much emphasis on summarizing the literature rather than trying to under understand the science. And I think the, the examples that I described earlier sort of uh, underlie that. You have uh, different animals, they're getting closer and closer to human beings. You want to extrapolate to human beings. Well, how are you going to do that? You have to build a response surface, meaning outcome versus input variables. And, uh, and that's science. It's, it's, it's building and not just summarizing the literature, whatever the curiosities that people have studied. <laughs> response surface, basically causal effects as a function of inputs, and the inputs are scientific variables like temperature, uh, uh, climate, age. Uh, the response surface must be estimated from observed studies, and so is a function of both the true response surface, the function of the science, which you think exists no matter what you do to learn about the science, uh, including the non-human non science, because again, uh, you're gonna have to extrapolate from uh, guinea pigs to macaques to human beings, where you really wanna know the answer. And des there's design factors, sample size, quality of the study, publication bias, the noise to be eliminated. And that's why you want to extrapolate that out. You want to get rid of that, of that junk that, that, that makes all these estimates noisy. Um, but both the science and design require extrapolation to obtain response surfaces for humans. Because the extrapolating from lower animals to humans is part of science. But extrapolating from a small sample size to a large sample size or from a perfectly designed randomized experiment to a sloppy observational study, that's design. That has nothing to do with the science. That has to, has, has, has to do with the noise in the system. Uh, so for an example is the effect of air pollution on humans, where you, where you believe that mortality under high air pollution minus mortality under low air pollution, you know, this potential outcomes view of what, what causal effects is, is a function of the science in the urban, rural, sex, age, race, and so forth, and design, randomized experiment, observational study, the closeness of the animals being studied to, to human beings and so forth. Uh, this is just a longer quote, just to show you, it's not, it's not a very long quote from, from Gene Glass's uh, article, so it's one page, one, one column of one page that appeared in Jazz in, uh, in 1992, I think. I'll say, okay, now the, there are complications with the implementation of this response surface conceptualization. Obviously, extrapolating the response surface to the perfect study answers for humans is what we're trying to do uh, from fa fallible actual studies. Defining the quality of the various studies, especially observational. For example, are they designed without access to the outcome data? This is, and this is a real objection that I have to, 
probably 95, maybe more percent of epidemiology and, and observational studies, they're not designed correctly. They're just, they, they're, they grab a data set, they start running regressions, ordinary least squares regressions or random effects models or logistic regressions, and they just look at answers. And they look at all these answers and then they pick one they get that's most publishable. That in my mind is, is just garbage. When you're designing randomized experiments, you don't look at the answer. In fact, that's one of the criteria for, for, uh, for submitting proposals to Food and Drug Administration in the US and EMA in, in, in Europe. So you have to design the randomized experiment before looking at the answer because the answer doesn't come till later. And you can't do 50 randomized experiments and, and just submit the best. It doesn't work. It's not approved. But why when analyzing observational studies do we have such low standards? And I think that's historical, that, that we, we, we didn't really understand, we, the scientific community, didn't know how to design and, and uh, analyze observational studies. So I, I strongly believe that observational studies should be designed blind to the outcome data. Have to design the study fully, specify it completely before allowing the, the data analysts to see any outcome data. And this can, this can be done. I've been writing about this for 10 years. Uh, also, you need to, to re, you need to rely on models. That's science. You have to rely on models. And the consequential sensitivity of conclusions to assumptions presently unassailable. I mean, whenever you build models, you're always sensitive to, to assumptions. But so often when you, when you read, observa especially observational studies, when they're published, there's no discussion of sensitivity to the models. They just throw down answers as if, they're, as if you should believe them. But, you know, uh, but there's always sensitivity to unassailable assumptions and they should be part of, of the analysis of observational studies. And therefore you should also be explicit about otherwise hidden assumptions and try to justify them and investigate sensitivity to them. And one, one th theme that I have is I think Really, to do this well, you have to be explicitly Bayesian. What I mean by that is you have to explicitly admit there are subjective choices you're making. And you have to say, okay, I'm, I'm assuming this. If this were true, this answer would follow. How sensitive is my answer to, to that assumption? Well, I have to investigate it. I can't just throw down an answer. Science is moving on all the time. So you, you should be taking a step towards what you think is the right answer, um, not just throwing down an answer that Get, gets your article published. And I, what I mean by response surfaces, these are just some, some, some picture that uh, I think sort of illustrate what the idea is, where obviously the axes are inputs, could be species, could be something else, and the response surface is where it goes high to low, and you're trying to understand what this response surface, when extrapolated to human beings, would actually look like. And I think the, the, the bridging study between adults and kids is sort of a, a good example of that. You're relying on PKPD modeling, pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic model, modeling that, that, that's based on uh, principles of pharmacology to, to do it. And you kind of believe it, but, but you don't really necessarily believe it. Science is open, you're gonna collect more data. Um, you, you're gonna, you, maybe you'll even, even change your, your answers about this. Um, and how to use a successfully estimated response service to guide recommendations and decisions. So this is one of these issues I think I'm throwing out not um, as, as an answer, but more as a, uh, as a task. Uh, so let's suppose that we actually have succeeded in this very difficult task of, of estimating this response service, possibly as a function of 50, 100 in genomic studies, half a million inputs. It's a little hard to do, but you know, it, it can be done, especially if you're explicit about assumptions and sensitivity. Well, a usually omitted quantitative task that's why this, this may be new. I, didn't, I haven't seen anything written about this in, in any of the uh, materials that, that were forwarded to me, but uh, you should formalize loss functions with public input to help achieve agreement from various sides. What are, what are, what are loss functions? Loss functions are some decisions cost more than others. And, and public debate on, on, on decisions often omits this step uh, entirely. And often there exists implicit agreement on the asymmetry of loss functions, but it's left to politicians to debate the proposed actions without consideration of loss functions. 
And I think it, public debate would be better informed if they included a step where you included the explicit statements about is there any agreement on loss functions? I mean, one, one uh, this r real example we'll talk about in a second, but in, in climate control, for example, now, well, what's the loss function? Well, if I destroy the planet, that's a big loss, I think. You know, we're no longer around in, in 100 years. Well, if I, if I say, well, it's not really so clear that all this pollution is really killing us, but, and we, we get to make more money for billionaires, well, here's a loss function. Oh, so what's the loss one way, what's the loss for the other way? Well, the loss, if you're wrong and you, and you pollute the planet, that's pretty serious. Loss the other way, billionaires aren't as rich. So that's a real loss, not to me. Um, and it, here's an example, a simple example of an asymmetric loss function. And I think that most people don't realize that when, when, you, when you summarize analyses in the usual way, with point estimates and standard errors and p-values and all that stuff, basically you're assuming a symmetric loss function. Making a mistake this way is just as costly as making a mistake the other way. Well, we know that's wrong. And here's my, my, uh, my particular example that I love to use. If you're five minutes late for an airplane, the loss is you miss the flight and you, you, you know, your world gets screwed up, at least for a day or two. Five minutes early for an airplane, the loss is you wasted five minutes sitting at the airport, having a drink or a Coke or a coffee or something. So what? It's not an asymmetric loss function to be five minutes early and five minutes late. More formal arguments sometimes help clarify. More formal arguments anywhere often uh, help, help to clarify. Uh, and they focus attention on where there is agreement and disagreement. And so you should use this formal loss function when, when, when possible. This other example I was going to talk about here very briefly, which I'll do in maybe five minutes I have, something about that. Uh, as I've, years ago, I was involved at uh, Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, on the issue of uh, in vitro fertilization. And should you implant, if you have three embryos available, if a couple has three embryos available, should you implant two and, 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 and freeze the other ones? Or should you implant one and freeze the other ones? And there's a lot of debate. Certainly, fertility clinics make more money the more f embryos they implant, so they like that. Uh, older couples often like more embryos being implanted because they believe that there's, uh, the chances of having a, a live birth will be increased. On the other hand, the chance of having multiple births is also increased. So if you implant two, you can have twins, triplets, even more. Is that good? Well, it's, it's not so good for the mother or the kids. The more miscarriages, the more spontaneous abortions. And so the, the consideration of these things, it helps be relatively formal about what are the loss functions. And you have to, and be, to be explicit with, with the couples on, on, on what the risks are. If they want to get a family out of the way right away because the couple's older, well, there's, a, there's, you know, there's the gain that you'll probably get, get the family out of the, ray, out of the way earlier, but will they be screwed up in some way? Will the mother be screwed up especially? C-sections go up. It's fairly, fairly obvious uh, in, in planning uh, uh, more. So I, I think that, that the, uh, the, the formal treatment is, um, is important. And here's just an addendum that I that added maybe a couple of days ago. I think the role of sensitivity analysis is, is really underappreciated. Um, and uh, some of these sensitivity analyses I've, I've, I've done for FDA, Food and Drug Administration in the US, where you show visually how conclusions can change with varying assumptions. And I, uh, I think sensitivity analyses in the past, they've been around for 50 years, where you, s you summarize how sensitive conclusions are to different assumptions that, that, that you make. But producing tables and tables and tables of numbers, which is what everybody has done for, for years and years, is not only bo uh, sort of boring to look at, but it's hard to understand, it's hard to really see what's, see what's going on. Uh, it, in the US FDA, for about maybe eight to 10 years, there have been something called tipping point displays for showing how visually showing how answers change as you change assumptions. And then there's something else called enhanced tipping point displays. But in fact, these uh, uh, sensitivity analyses are greatly enhanced by computers. Not only the fact that we can now compute different things, but we can display different things. And I'm just going to illustrate right now by running up and down. 
Look at how many, now if, you, if each time you were looking at it, at a picture of how things change, you could look at, at hundreds of different things very, very quickly. So you don't have to produce a, a ream of paper. You can produce a, a flash drive that, that we displayed lots and lots of results. And this is the way, this is what's needed for sensitivity analyses. So I guess I'm just gonna close there saying, I, because there are two possibly some newer ideas. One is to include loss functions when, when explicitly con considering the, the results of these uh, response surface generalizations to human beings. And the other is use uh, sensitivity analyses uh, and, and take advantage of the power of modern com com computing, not only for computation, but for displays, for displays the results. I think it's especially interesting because they, they both are sort of new research efforts, as, at least as far as in, in, in my experience dealing with uh, not toxicology, but other, other kinds of response or generalizations of results. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Urban. We have a, a time for a couple of short questions. Maybe one. Please. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for your excellent presentation. My name is Dick Sein from the Netherlands. My question is about your design of the study. So, and one of the important things is to leave out knowledge or papers. Can you describe that well in, in your assumptions of how you do a study or how you publish a study? Could you repeat the beginning? I, I didn't hear it so clearly. I th uh, my question is on uh, um, that in many of the studies in your experiments, you leave out knowledge, you leave out papers. And sometimes you do it on purpose, and sometimes you do it not on purpose. How can you best describe such assumptions in leaving out information? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not absolutely sure what you mean by leaving out in information. I, mean, I guess you, when, when always leaves out in information to some extent when designing studies, I mean, it's one of the points of trying to be objective. Uh, you don't put, uh, I mean, if you are being a Bayesian, you don't put in everything that you personally feel is true. Because uh, if you do, there, there are too many uh, assumptions in, uh, being involved. In fact, one of the principles of experimental design is you should try to be as objective as possible. Uh, so I, I think one of the thing ways to, to measure different studies is by what kind of assumptions are in there and, and how much you, you believe in them. And my attitude, as long as the uh, reviewer of these studies, the person who's building a response surface, uh, is explicit about what they're doing, that's okay. I don't know if that helps at all, but that's as close as I can come right, right now to answering the question. Okay. One more question? Last question. Thank you very much. My name is Matthias Greiner from Germany, and I would like to thank you for this very interesting presentation. Uh, can you just briefly explain whether there's a conceptual difference between response surface and meta re regression, if there's any conceptual difference? Uh, and, and what kind of regression? Uh, meta, meta regression. I, I don't know what meta re regression is, but if, if you mean by regression, the expectation of something as a function of inputs, there's no difference. But I think the word, the, the uh, I guess one, one of the uh, objections that one could have to regression is it's too often uh, coupled with ordinary least squares regression, whereas response surface is, is a phrase that goes back I don't know, a couple hundred years and is well developed in, in uh, experimental design where they're constantly talking about nonlinear response surfaces and fitting them using splines and other stuff that's, that's far more uh, computer intensive kind of and creative than, than when you say regression. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Rubin. Please uh, join me to thank Professor for his talk. Thank you. So it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Chris uh, Thayer. Uh, she uh, serves as a, an integrated risk information system division director. It's IRIS at the US uh, EPA um, National Center for Environmental Assessment, NACIA.
uh, IRIS assessments uh, identify the uh, potential for a chemical to cause cancer or non-cancer health effects in people. And I considered uh, the top tier source of toxicity information used by EPA and other agencies to inform national standards, uh, cleanup levels at local sites and uh, set advisory levels. Uh, IRIS uses systematic review methods to evaluate epidemiological and toxicological literature and include consideration of rele relevant mechanistic evidence. Prior to joining EPA, Dr. Thayer uh, was deputy director, de deputy division director of analysis at the National Toxicology Program and director of the NTP Office of uh, Health Assessment and Translation, OHAT, uh, located at the campus of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. As uh, Deputy Division Director of Analysis, uh, she oversaw OHAT and uh, NTP Office of the Report on Carcinogens. She is considered an expert uh, on the application of systematic reviews um, methods uh, to environmental health topics and the use of uh, specialized software and automation approaches to facilitate conducting systematic reviews. It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Thayer. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. You're a wonderful host. So. So uh, what I wanted to do today is talk a bit about integrating evidence within and across evidence streams. And I want to try to use the EFSA Weight of Evidence 2017 report as a bit of an anchoring point. And if you've looked at some of the, the program materials, you'll see that in the discussion, we want to begin to sort of talk about application of grade and grade-like frameworks toward evidence integration. And so what I want to do in my talk is to give you a little bit of context about why people have sort of begun to focus on grade. And then I also want to talk about some of our experiences to date in applying grade to environmental health. Okay, so just to start, I'm going to talk about some of the key considerations for weighing evidence. And this, again, I'm going to be sort of using definitions that are outlined in this EFSA 2017 report. Before I talk about the definitions, probably you're going to have sort of a variety of responses. In some cases, for some of you, these definitions are going to be very familiar. In other cases, you're going to find that you don't use these words. <laughs> or if you use these words, you use them in different contexts. And so I think that sort of, and this is, this is going to come up several times in my talk, and I think it's going to come up a lot in the discussion, but I think that if we really want to have a meaningful discussion, what we have to do is accept that within this group, there's going to be sort of a lot of different terms and uses, even within the EPA, even among programs that do chemical assessments, there's a variety of terms that are used. My program doesn't use many of these terms, and when we do, we don't use them in this way. And so it can be very, very distracting when you're having conversations about structured frameworks to talk past each other because you're getting confused on terms. So just sort of, you know, I, th I think, again, moving into the discussion section, try to focus on concepts that are, that are encapsulated in some of these definitions. You may also find that you struggle with the terms used to describe concepts, and you may, if that happens, have to even get to the point of just talking about examples or scenarios. In my experience, sometimes when you go there, then it sort of facilitates the, the broader discussions about being able to anchor across different experience and structures. Okay, <laughs> so that's it. <laughs> Again, going back to sort of the EFSA terminology. Re reliability, the extent to which information comprising a piece or line of evidence is correct. So in this case, when you think about a piece of evidence, this can be something that's assessed at the individual study level. So it could be an experiment within a publication. It could be a piece of modeled evidence. Um, it can also be assessed at sort of a line of evidence so where you're beginning to think about it across studies. And so line of evidence can also be sometimes referred to as evidence stream. At sort of most basic level in some of these environmental health assessments, it could be talking about human, animal, mechanistic information as being sort of evidence streams. It can be broken down to be more granular, but the idea is that when you think about reliability, typically it's assessed at the individual study level as well as sort of across studies that live within a line of evidence. So, um, it includes both accuracy, degree of systematic error bias, so this might be sort of risk of bias in the systematic review terminology, and precision, degree of random error, which as you'll find out for those of you who know grade, it's sort of envisioned a bit differently within the grade structure. So relevance is the contribution a piece or line of evidence would make to answer a specified question. So really it's sort of how close is this information to the question that you're trying to address. And there's a few ways that this is sort of dealt with in the context of a systematic review or a structured framework. So in the systematic review, through the screening process, studies that are really not relevant at all would get screened out. 
But typically, after you've gone through that process, you still have left on the tables some studies that are not maybe directly relevant, but they're not irrelevant. And so that's where it sort of begins to fall into the space of when you're now um, thinking about how do you characterize the evidence that you're using in your assessment, trying to characterize the relevance or applicability of that evidence. So again, I think that relevance is typically something that gets, can get applied at the individual study level as well as sort of across studies within a line of evidence. And then consistency, there's probably you know, less confusion about the word consistency, so now you're just sort of looking at sort of how do these different pieces or lines of evidence contribute to answering a specified question. So some trends in weighing evidence, um, also referred to as evidence integration. Again, you're going to see a lot of just sort of different terminology here. Um, conclusions express as some version of certainty or confidence in a body of evidence. It could be a confidence statement. It could be a hazard descriptor, known carcinogen, robust evidence. It could be, um, if you look at some of the climate change reports, it could be sort of probability or likelihoods that might reflect expert judgments. And so in that case, the numbers aren't really a, a statistical analysis. They're more sort of a communication uh, vehicle. Typically, evidence integration happens, uh, it can be qualitative or quantitative, but um, certainly across evidence streams, qualitative is far more common. And I would say that there is, certainly within my program, there is a keen interest in trying to be more quantitative, um, but it's, it's an area that's it's, it's really more in the methods development. It's not typically applied. Typically, conclusions are reached within evidence streams or lines of evidence. Again, this might be sort of within a human evidence stream, within an animal evidence stream, within sort of a mechanistic ev evidence stream, prior to integrating across. Um, and assessment protocols often include development of a prelimi preliminary analysis plan to help identify what the best available evidence is. And so this is sort of, um, as we thought within environmental health, where again, sort of our questions tend to be very broad. You know, what are the health effects associated with exposure to X, Y, or Z? And you're thinking about human, animal, mechanistic evidence as being potentially relevant. So typically what happens is there might be some sort of inventorying of the literature so you can get a sense of what's there. Is there a lot of human evidence? Is there a lot of mechanistic evidence? And that begins to sort of inform sort of how you would do the, the assessment. For those of you who've, who've spoken to, to Paul Whaley, there's a lot of interest in sort of systematic maps as a way to sort of outline this, but it's really as a tool to sort of how do you direct your resources when you're doing the assessment. So for example, if you have a lot of traditional evidence, human evidence, animal bioassay evidence, then the amount that you sort of drill down on the in vitro evidence might be less. So and again, this is sort of a, a picture, figure two from the EFSA um, weight of evidence document. This is just showing, showing the within evidence streams. So this does work or not? Okay. So sort of showing that within evidence streams, lines of evidence, conclusions are reached prior to across. And so this sort of, uh, I guess, summarizes some of the concepts I've already mentioned. So at the bottom here, uh, there, you might sort of get a sense of your available information. There might be some preliminary considerations of relevance and reliability. So again, that, that relevance might happen in sort of the, the PICO framework or the screening, screening studies in and out. Um, Preliminary consideration of reliability, the way that I see a lot of people try to use this is they might use sort of a, a reporting quality tool to help triage the literature. If a study is so poorly reported that you can't assess risk of bias, then, then it might not go further. It could also be for some of the environmental exposure studies, the EPI studies, there could be deal breakers, especially when you think about the way that exposure is measured. If it's, really, if it's measured in a way that you know you're not really going to be able to do with then it might be a way to sort of pull that study out so it doesn't proceed further. And again, sort of the, the systematic maps might live here. And then you begin to sort of organize your evidence, broadly speaking, human, animal, mechanistic, but more granular, you can certainly do that. And then you begin to sort of look at your lines of evidence. Um, here it's referred to as sort of weighing the evidence, where in my program it could also be referred to as evidence synthesis strength of evidence, so again, there's different terminologies to sort of refer to the same step. Um, and, then, and then there's a, a, a place where you sort of go across the evidence, the evidence integration. Uh, you probably can't read this, but um, so this would just sort of be in the IARC uh, construct, a matrix, but where you have evidence coming from animals, 
and humans, and you sort of see a matrix approach where you're thinking about your, your strengths of evidence and these lines of evidence, and then a, a matrix to go across to sort of help you orient to how you reach conclusions about whether something is, is a known, probable, possible human carcinogen. Uh, mechanistic information is certainly not as well developed in terms of a structured framework. It's usually sort of thought about as more supporting information that might be used to increase or de decrease your confidence based on human and animal data. At, at the National Toxicology Program, um, Office of Health Assessment Translation, or OHAT, sort of a very similar construct, in this case applied to non-carcinogens, but where you're looking at uh, human evidence and animal evidence and using sort of a matrix based on your co conclusions from each and then thinking sort of secondarily about how uh, mechanistic data informs your, your confidence. Um, at EPA IRIS, uh, we don't have sort of public documents outlining this, but we use the same kind of approach. Um, also, we also sort of explicitly have this step here where we sort of organize, have, have it a step of a preliminary analysis plan where we begin to organize our evidence. So here's an example of some weight of evidence criteria or guidance, and this is coming from uh, table B3 in the EFSA document. So you find some here, some, uh, I guess, some greatest hits. Uh, um, there's Bradford Hill considerations. Um, there's an old EPA <laughs> document. Uh, the newer one isn't, wasn't citable when this came out. Um, there's also Grade is in here under the Morgan reference. Uh, OHAT is under Rooney. And so this list is not meant to be comprehensive, but it's examples of different sort of approaches for trying to sort of frameworks for weighing the evidence. So some ob observations of that table, as many, probably most, are sort of list of considerations. Bradford Hill, they might be definitions, or lists, but they're really not structured frameworks in the sense that they give you guidance about how to, how to apply the considerations. There is um, a lot of sort of essentially very similar content, but variation in terminology. Relevance is sort of approximately equal to directness, approximately equal to applicability. Reliability, sort of like study quality, risk of bias. So you'll find again sort of a lot of the same content, but expressed differently. Use of structured frameworks for weighted evidence is becoming more common in chemical assessments. Um, grade is, this, is often the starting point. So in that table in the ESSA document, that would be uh, the Morgan citation. Uh, OHAT uses a sort of a derivation of grade as does the UCSF navigation guide. My program is using a, a, an approach derived from grade as well. I would say that um, you know, I think there's a lot of interest in environmental health of using these structured frameworks, but parts of it is are is still in a method development stage. And so, you know, on one hand, we're applying structured frameworks, but we're also trying to work closely with the grade working group to sort of work through pain points. And so, so they're happening hand in hand. And what we wanna do, ideally, is keep that collaboration discussing so that we sort of avoid the idea about having derivations from grade, but then having ways that sort of fall under grade of how to operationalize some of these considerations that we're finding that we have to think about in environmental health that don't already exist. So why? Why is there a lot of interest in grade? Well, it's widely used over 100 plus organizations. Um, I'm not gonna go through this, but um, it includes consideration of the weight of evidence factors that were part of um, the EFSA document. So in that table B3, they had columns for reliability, relevance, combinations of reliability and relevance, and consistency. And GRADE has aspects to consider all of those. So it sort of covers the essential content. And compared to the other approaches in the EFSA document, GRADE conducts research and develops guidance to operationalize considerations. And I think this is a really a distinguishing feature. I and mean, there's quite a lot of publications derived from the method development. There's a handbook. There's software applications to help facilitate consistent application of grade. There's meetings that are very sort of intense method development based meetings. There's typically case examples to work through the method development issues and then very robust discussion of those. So I think this sort of really sets grade off from many of the other um, approaches that are out there. Grade working group is open and free membership. 
And again, it's sort of dedicated to method development and it's adaptable. So I know that uh, for most of you in this audience, if you are familiar with GRADE, you're probably mostly familiar with the framework for interventions. But there are frameworks for prognostic factors and values and preferences. So the point here is that, again, this is sort of just setting up the tone for today's discussion later on, is that, is that there is adaptability. There is adaptability. And the GRADE framework can be sort of tailored toward different kinds of questions. And so I think it's, it's, not, it's not whimsical. It's not so much the sense that you find something that doesn't seem to work and then, aha, you come up with a new grade framework for that question. It's based on pulling together case examples, talking about them very carefully, making sure that people aren't didn't getting confused by the terminology differences that are, that are very real, and working through this. But I think that there has to be sort of an openness on both sides that, that probably a lot of the issues that we're talking about in environmental health when we think about grade probably can apply to grade. We just have to sort of be patient and work through the case studies. So what is grade? And this is sort of at a very, very, very high level. Um, Holger in the discussion may go a little bit more in detail. But um, so these are the factors, some of the factors that you would think about that might downgrade or decrease your confidence in body of evidence. Are the research studies well done? That's risk of bias. Are the results consistent across studies? That would be considered in grade as part of uh, unexplained inconsistency. How directly do the results relate? That's indirectness. Is the association precise, um, imprecision? Are all the studies that have been conducted present, so publication bias? And then there's a number of considerations that you might think about that might increase your, your confidence in the body of evidence. Large associations, worst case scenario predictors still allow strong conclusions, and exposure effect relationships. So in terms of the, the certainty of the evidence, some of the, the grade uh, ratings and the definitions, so high certainty might translate to a panel being very confident that the true association lies uh, close to that of the estimate of the association. It might also mean that additional research in this area isn't likely going to change that conclusion. And then you can sort of uh, get a sense of uh, going down to very low, the very little confidence in the association. The true association is likely very different from the estimate of the association. And then you have, obviously, the, the middle ranges. So some experience in applying grade to chemical assessments. I think probably these conversations first started um, three to four years ago. And I think there was a range of reactions from, uh, great, we can work with this to uh, th think um, some people thinking that grade was too simplistic, it was based on RCTs, it won't work for our complex environmental health evidence, it devalues epi epidemiological research, it's inflexible, it, it appears to be algorithmic. <laughs> so in my experience, when I was at the National Toxicology Program, I was working with a program that was more on the, great, we can work with this, so more of the early adopters. In my current uh, you know, role at EPA, I'm with a group who is a bit more uh, reluctant to embrace grade, and so I have both experiences. Um, but I can tell you that I think, I think the openness over the past several years to partnering and working through the pain points um, has moved forward. Uh, even, even among the people who maybe uh, several years ago were sort of resistant about thinking about grade because they, had, they have, you know, associated with RCTs, um, they recognize the value of having a structured framework. You know, and in particular, as sort of a manager of somebody who does assessments, you can think about if you have a program and you have dozens of people working on assessments, in my case, who live in different areas, <laughs> you want to make sure that it's not any given Sunday on how the assessments are conducted. So there's a lot of value in having sort of structured frameworks. And I think, again, even people who are maybe res who are not that familiar with grade and maybe have uh, you know, didn't sort of catch that first wave. I do think now that there's, there's this more embracement of this idea of working together to come up with structured frameworks. So the GRADE established an environmental health project group in 2015 to address some, some of these methodological issues. Some of the priority areas were evaluation of observational studies of en environmental occupational exposure, application of GRADE to animal mechanistic and model evidence, integration across evidence streams, how do we think about assessing biological plausibility? How do we assess coherence and consistency? Currently, uh, grade downgrades for unexplained inconsistency, but doesn't have a way to sort of upgrade for coherence or consistency. Um, and also applying grade to non-systematic reviews and under rapid time frames. So this is sort of to queue up some of the issues that I think are gonna come out in the discussions later today. <laughs> 
I think probably there's going to be a lot of discussion about thinking about biological plausibility, thinking about consistency and coherence, and thinking about something that's not on this list about sort of sensitivity of the study. So it sort of falls in this area, not quite risk of bias, maybe part of indirectness, but it's not clear really how to sort of operationalize that within the grade framework. Here's just a snapshot of some of the environmental health project group activities. We've done some work uh, collaborating with Julian and others um, in terms of the epidemiological evidence. I'm not going to go into this too much detail. This probably won't make sense for some of you unless you're an epidemiologist who follows GRADE, and I apologize for that. But basically, uh, trying to sort of uh, work um, to follow work that's been done in developing a risk of bias tool for non randomized studies of interventions that really sort of has this uh, anchoring of trying to identify an ideal target trial and then assess risk of bias based of that. And then trying to sort of modify that approach or extrapolate that approach to looking at studies of exposures. And so there's some nuances there. Um, it may not be obvious, again, unless you're really following this closely, but that actually has some pretty significant implications for how observational studies are considered within grade. Um, the byproduct of that would be that, uh, for those of you who know GRADE, that all studies would start at high, and that you would sort of use the risk of bias tool to sort of let it know where you settle. Um, and it sort of would remove this perception of double downgrading for concerns. In terms of animal evidence, there's numerous groups that have applied GRADE to animal evidence. This would be both in toxicology and preclinical research. Um, I think the impact of the status, I think the idea is that the grade factors apply, but additional examples are needed to help develop the guidance for more consistent application. Uh, mechanistic evidence is sort of wide open. Um, modeled evidence, we recently had a workshop in May at McMaster to talk about grade for modeled evidence. At this workshop, we had people who work with modeled evidence in environmental health, read across pharmacokinetic modeling, um, economics, infectious disease, so a very wide group of sort of folks who work with modeled evidence to think about whether grade as a framework could generally apply. And I think the idea was that grade could apply the way that you might conceive some of those considerations may differ from modeled evidence compared to toxicology evidence, but it, but it does apply. And again, sort of additional examples are needed to help uh, develop guidance. Evidence integration. So numerous groups are using grade-derived approaches for within evidence stream input, so within human studies, within animal studies. Um, so right now, I, I mentioned that it's a parallel consideration approach. This is very similar to what I mentioned before, that the groups seem to be looking at these evidence streams separately and then integrating across. And I think maybe one of the discussion points that may come out today is whether there are alternatives to have a more integrated approach up front. Um, and rapid response, so applying grade to non-systematic reviews and urgent timelines. I think there was this perception that, that all the people sort of liked the idea of structured frameworks for expressing your, your confidence in the evidence, this perception that you could only apply it if you had a systematic review. And environmental health, we don't have that history, so we don't have m many of those. And th that was perceived as a barrier to applying grade. But it doesn't have to be, and I think if you think about that, that makes a lot of sense. You can probably, uh, even if you had a narrative view, your view or um, even expert input, you could probably think about some of those same considerations, consistency, risk of bias. So some examples of applying grade to chemical assessments. Probably one of the first is UCSF Navigation Guide, PFOA and fetal growth. They have a series of papers in environmental health perspective. They started off with looking at uh, human evidence for PFO effects on fetal growth. So again, within an evidence stream conclusions. You probably can't read this, but they have, uh, they applied grade, um, or at least their uh, perception of grade, and came out with sort of a moderate confidence in the evidence. Oh, five minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I might speed it up. Um, And then did the same for animal studies and came up with moderate. And then from there, both integrated across those to sort of indicate that moderate confidence in, in non-human animal, moderate quality of evidence of human equaled uh, conclusion of known. I'm going to go, I'm going to speed through these fast for the sake of time, but this is just another example again from OHAT, PFO and suppression of antibody response. If you read this closely, and again, some of this may come up in discussion, you'll see that uh, in terms of the 
application of grade, there's a, there's a consideration here for consistency across species and models. A recent example from the National Academy of Sciences in summer 2017 report, this panel used a grade to, write, to reach confidence ratings on looking at phthalates and indication of anogenital distance effects in humans and animals. And then finally, sort of grade and rapid response, this is just sort of a, a publication, it's more of a conceptual publication uh, that sort of outlines uh, how grade could be applied to rapid time frames or when you don't have a systematic review as a starting point. And it outlines different levels of urgency, ranging from sort of hours to days, in, in the case of like an Elk River uh, chemical spill, to weeks, to maybe a few months, to no particular urgency. Any questions? Please. Hi, I, I'm Andy. Hi, Chris. Hi. Andy Hart. Um, uh, I wondered, um, uh, thinking about the two presentations, yours and uh, uh, Professor Rubin's, um, uh, I'm interested in whether within grade there is, uh, within the grade uh, activity, there is any movement uh, towards a more quantitative expression of the overall output of the activity that would go closer to what uh, the first speaker was saying about the advantages of being quantitative, thinking of being explicitly Bayesian, thinking in terms of response surface that allows you to extrapolate and make uh, predictions about, uh, uh, about uh, interventions and so on. Um, seems to me that there are some big advantages to have there uh, and, that, and that it would be quite natural to use the grade system uh, as a basis for informing the judgments that would be needed to fit into a bias-adjusted meta-analysis or something like that. Is, is that something that grade is actively developing or does grade see these confidence ratings and so on as the, as the final point of their journey? Well, I know in terms of sort of our application of grade, we want to apply it to both. But I think in terms of the historical perspective, I think I'm going to defer to Holger, if you can, about sort of, I know this is probably something that you've already considered. Yeah, I mean, I can, it's, I, again, I can just sort of say that for us, we, we, we would like to apply in both contexts. And, and I would just add, so um, uh, a bias-adjusted meta-analysis, if um, it is trustworthy, is certainly something that um, we would want to consider. So I don't think it stops here. Um, it's about applying methods that may be developed by others um, um, in the framework, in the context of the great framework, in the domains of great. So um, it wouldn't stop here, but it depends a lot on um, development by others, I guess. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Great. So uh, next uh, in the uh, next talk, um, Professor Julian Higgins is going to talk about the recent developments uh, for combining evidence within evidence streams and bias-adjusted meta-analysis. This is a very interesting topic that I know many of us uh, are struggling with. So uh, let me introduce uh, briefly Dr. Uh, Dr. Higgins. Uh, he comes to us from uh, Bristol uh, Medical School and Population Health Sciences uh, Program uh, at the. Uh, Department, uh, Department of uh, Bristol Medical School. He's a director of research for population health sciences and uh, leads the Bristol appraisal and reviews of uh, research group and has the Center for Research Synthesis and Decision Analysis. He has a uh, wide ranging research interest in the area of systematic reviews and meta-analysis. He was previously uh, chair in evidence synthesis at the University of York and a program leader at the MRC Biostatistics Unit in Cambridge. Please welcome. Thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to talk to you today about some ideas in the area of bias adjustment. Essentially, I want to overview some of the options that are available, particularly from the field of interventions research where I'm coming from, uh, to inform the discussions later in the day about whether any of these can be used in to toxicology. I'll start by with some comments on concepts and then spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, what people tend to do at the moment before moving on to the sort of things that might be used a bit more often in the future. 
my starting point is that if we're going to put a result of a study into some sort of ev evidence integration, uh, it's really important that we understand the extent to which uh, the, these results can be believed. And the standard way of thinking about believability results these days, I think, really is to think about the idea of risk of bias. Uh, just to clarify, uh, risk of bias, what I'm talking about is something distinct from imprecision reflected in the confidence interval, uh, but important nevertheless. So it's a slightly distinct notion from quality in the sense that even if we do a, a study the very best we possibly can, i.e. to the highest quality, it doesn't mean we remove all the, the biases. And similarly, some markers of good quality research don't actually impact on bias. So uh, I draw a distinction between those. And of course, I'm not talking about reporting quality. Uh, of course, we need access to information about how studies were done to enable us to uh, evaluate risk of bias. So if there's some things that risk of bias is not, what is it? Uh, so bias might be loosely defined as a systematic deviation from the truth, but what do we mean by the truth? I find that a framework to think about bias uh, particularly helpful and will infl it infiltrates my thinking these days is the idea that if we have a study in front of us, um, it's unbiased if the result it gives us is equivalent to what some hypothetical perfect experiment would have given us. That perfect experiment um, ideally would involve randomization to, to reduce or to remove uh, confounding. It would be big, it would be reasonably pragmatic, but it would be free from all the problems that we, we might have in the study we're looking at. And this is very much borrowed from uh, uh, Miguel Anand's work in, uh, at Harvard. Uh, we use the term target experiment or target trial for that notion. And of course, if it's an idealized study that's addressing the same research question that the study we've got is, it need not be ethical, it need not be feasible, and it probably won't in most of the situations, sort of examples of counterfacts vaccine described earlier. And by uh, defining this target experiment, it allows us to distinguish issues that put our study at risk of bias from issues of relevance of our study to the research question at hand. And again, as Chris said, there are lots of terms for these things. I'm talking about risk of bias, uh, often people use internal validity, it's divorcing that from issues of applicability or directness in the grade language. So there are a lot of tools to assess um, the strength of uh, information in a particular study. Well over 20 years ago, 30 tools were reviewed by David Moe just for looking at randomized trials. Ten years ago, we reviewed tools for uh, looking at observational studies. Situations that have for a long time been a bit of a mess. Too many tools, uh, not a lot of them really targeting uh, everything, anything comprehensively or very clearly. But I want to just show an example of how these things typically have been used uh, in probably the majority of evidence syntheses. Just taking an example of a, an EFSA document here looking at uh, pesticides. Uh, the authors put together their own little tool to evaluate the studies that they brought together, looking at a particular set of features and deciding whether they were uh, present or not in the studies and using the number of features that were met to put uh, studies into quality categories. They did a little meta-analysis. Here are six studies looking at effective pesticides on leukemia. And the way they address risk of bias, which is pretty typical of many, many reviews, is just a comment in the text saying, well, here's the meta-analysis, but most of the studies were at low or moderate quality. We want to do a bit better than that in a more quantitative sense, and that's where we're heading towards the bias adjustment. That was a, really a tool looking at quality. I would say the modern standard uh, um, for examining these issues is to use risk of bias assessment tools. Um, I'm, of course, a bit biased because I've worked in some of these. Uh, the, I think by far the most popular tool for looking at randomized trials is the Cochrane's tool uh, that we published about uh, six years ago. And last year, as Chris mentioned, we, we produced the Robbins tool. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that. Chris also mentioned that we're developing the Robbins E tool, which would be much more directly relevant to the toxicology studies we're looking at here. And, and the OHAT tool is uh, one that it has, is, is, is completed, so that's really out there and available for use. The Robbins tools, um, 
I'm interesting to give a little, a little, just two slides about them. Uh, separate issues of bias into seven domains, taking the established epidemiological concepts of confounding, selection bias, and measurement bias, and splitting each of those into what you might call pre-exposure issues and post-exposure issues. The pre-exposure issues are the things that are all resolved by randomization, but in observational studies, they're really important to think about. The post-exposure issues are the things that could go wrong in randomized trials as well as observational studies. And at the end, we've added uh, selective reporting, clearly uh, people cherry-picking the result that they like from their study. This is what the Robbins Eye tool looks like. That's not for you to read, just to show you how it's structured. Um, and the idea is that we start by thinking preliminarily about some important issues that we're going to, to be uh, looking at, in particular specifying the important confounders and important interventions that might be at play. And then we, we obtain the, the study that we want to put into an evidence synthesis. We select the result that we're interested in, and we focus the risk of bias assessment on that result. And we start by setting up a target experiment uh, that's equivalent to what this study was trying to achieve and specify um, the quantity and pattern of exposure and the nature of the exposure outcome relationship that we want to, to characterize. Then we, we're doing each of those seven domains. We have a series of questions that uh, try to elicit reasonably factual information about what happened, supported by free text descriptions. They, they lead us to a judgment about risk of bias within each domain, and there's an optional component to try and predict the direction of bias. And then across those bias domains, we get an overall risk of bias judgment. And having these domain-based assessments allows us to illustrate graphically uh, the, the profile of problems in individual studies. This is, these are trials of screening for breast cancer, nothing to do with toxicology, but it, it was a nice example where we can see on the top the, the, the good trials, those that uh, are assessed to be low risk of bias in all features, and at the bottom those that have some problems. And so this sort of stratification of study results in a simple meta-analysis is one of the other most common approaches to a, a, a dealing with risk of bias issues in evidence synthesis. So now we're going to start talking about five broad approaches that we might take to try and adjust for bias. The first, weighting by some measure of quality or risk of bias, is an idea that dates back a long, long way into the uh, history of meta-analysis, um, but it requires us to quantify the risk of bias so that we get a number that we can feed into the, the weight that we assign to a study when we combine it with other studies. So we need some sort of risk of bias score or traditionally a quality score. There has been quite a lot of pushback against the idea from the evidence synthesis community, particularly in medicine. Uh, the title of this paper speaks for itself and there have been other papers uh, criticizing the use of quality scores essentially because they involve implicit weights of the different domains that we're looking at. So how do we say how much, how much more important good randomization is compared with good blinding, for example, in a trial? And uh, Peter Uni's work. So really strong pushing back against uh, using numerical studies to represent quality. My own view is that we've gone a little bit too far and that there is some merit to these sorts of approaches. And indeed, um, I think the authors in the audience, and we'll hear from in, in the small group later, there, there is a, a new, newer campaign to include elements of quality into weights in a meta-analysis. And uh, you can see uh, this quality effects model adjusts the weights according to the, the variance contribution due to internal study biases. We can talk about that in a small group later. Weighting by quality or by risk of bias is an indirect way of uh, adjusting for bias in that basically what we're, just, we're doing is shifting the weight towards the better studies. Uh, it's not really a direct attempt at adjustment, but it's one of the options on the table. The second one is using regression type approaches. And there are a number of regression type approaches. We could just put in, for example, we could, if we did have a quality score we are trusted, we could try and use that to predict the size of the effect in the different studies and predict the uh, 
uh, size of effect we would see in a perfect study that has a perfect score. Uh, another application of regression approach, which is quite neat if we've got lots of studies of the same thing, is to base a regression on the idea of a funnel plot, which some of you may have seen before. Here, each of these dots is, uh, represents the result of one study, and along the left, the vertical axis is essentially how big the study was. So we'd expect the very big studies to get the answer bang on, but the small studies at the bottom to be subject to a lot of error and be distributed in their effects. Um, in, so in a perfect world, we would see a funnel-shaped plot like this, an inverted funnel. However, there are mechanisms of bias that might lead to some parts of the plot being missing. In particular, for example, if there is a publication bias of a particular nature, then it may be that uh, the studies that had null or um, unfavorable results are suppressed, and we end up with asymmetry in the plot. We might end up with similar asymmetry if the, 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 the smaller studies um, are done with biases, with methodological flaws that pushes their results to the left. And the regression approach in this context might just be uh, investigating the relationship between these two variables, the effect size and the standard error in this case, and extrapolating that line to an infinitely large study. And it has been proposed by Santiago Moreno, Santiago Moreno and others as a, as a way to adjust for bias across studies. We could use these sort of regression and extrapolation approaches for all sorts of predictors, uh, but particularly, the, I've shown an example of previous uh, study size. We could use risk of bias profiles, uh, have a multiple dummies for different domains, or we could put them into a quality score with all the uh, problems people have articulated about that. A third approach, so those two approaches really are at the, the synthesis level. These next two are really about adjusting individual study results. And the first possibility is a, what I call a direct adjustment. The idea here is just to think about, well, what are the particular problems in this study and how might I directly address them? Uh, and the idea goes back I mean, a very long way to one of the very earliest texts on meta-analysis, uh, Hunter and Schmidt working in the psychometrics area, uh, doing meta-analysis of correlations would, would typically correct those correlations for artifacts in artifactual uh, problems. But m in the more uh, health area, uh, one possibility is to adjust for or to impute missing data. That's taking the particular problem of biases due to missing data and correcting results by making assumptions about, well, what outcomes might have been observed in those missing people. And we can do that with, with assumptions, of course, at an aggregate data level. Um, in the more toxicological area, these this really interesting paper looking at diesel exhaust and lung cancer, where they essentially did a whole host of sensitivity analyses for individual studies, um, making assumptions about what was the likely degree of confounding or the likely degree of misclassification. Again, it's very specific biases, thinking through um, exactly what might have happened in this individual study because of this specific problem. And then, Here's another example looking at benzene exposure uh, for, and its impact on non-Hodgkin lymphoma, where the authors identified healthy worker effects as a problem and adjusted the results of studies prone to healthy worker effects using a sort of negative control argument in that they looked at the effect of the exposure on um, outcomes that should not be affected by exposure and the confounding, usually healthy worker effect, would affect those results. But if they use that result to uh, essentially correct for that type of confounding in the outcomes they were looking at, then they, they got a, a bias adjustment for that very specific bias. The fourth area is the one I, I, I suspect I was primarily invited to talk about. I'm not entirely <laughs> sure. Uh, this is taking... Uh, Bayesian approaches to the uh, analysis of each individual study result and putting prior distributions on the amount of bias that we think that result may be subject to. And the two main areas, at least in my area, two main papers in my area are uh, this one by Becky Turner and co. from Cambridge, where uh, they take a very Bayesian approach where these prior distributions for the amount of bias in, in each individual study are elicited 
from experts, giving them details of the study, uh, not the results, ideally, um, and asking them to essentially draw a picture for how much bias they think there was and how uncertain they are about that. You might feel a bit uncomfortable about eliciting from experts. So the alternative uh, that uh, is probably, I know, is more commonly used now in, in at least synthesis of trials is to use empirically based prior distributions based on reanalysis of large numbers of meta-analyses. Because uh, I think this is a really neat area that could have, it, it would be great if it could impact on toxicology, but there are various reasons why that could be problematic. But I'll show you what it's all about. Uh, it, it stems back to a, a paper by Ken Schultz and co. back in 95, which we call a meta-epidemiological study, where they looked at 33 meta-analyses, including 250 trials, and reanalyzed them to uh, determine that the trials that didn't conceal their allocation sequence at the point of randomization, i.e. people could fiddle randomization in theory, were associated with a 41% exaggeration of the effect of that intervention and a smaller effect for trials that didn't describe themselves as a double blind, not blind. How do these things work? The idea is that we take, we start with one meta-analysis. So here, example, suppose I've got six studies uh, of the same exposure outcome uh, relationship. And suppose, according to some particular feature, or more, more generally, I could say that three of them are good uh, and three of them are bad. We do a meta-analysis of good ones, and a meta-analysis of the bad ones, and estimate the difference between those two results. We do the same in another meta-analysis on a completely different area, but as long as we're looking at the same bias feature, and we do it for a whole load of meta-analyses. So we get a whole load of estimates of differences between good and bad studies according to uh, whatever our definition of good versus bad is. And then we take those results, put them together in a, in a meta-analysis, and we get our arguably best and most precise estimate of the bias caused by this particular flaw that we're using to distinguish between the good and the bad studies. So that's how a meta-epidemiological study works, and it gives us data about the likely bias due to a particular flaw. As long as these meta-analyses are selected from the same broad type of community of studies as the ones we're putting into our synthesis, then we might use these results to put prior distributions on bias. Since the Schultz study, in trials, there have been a whole load of big meta-epidemiological studies. So we've got really quite good evidence now on numerous flaws in trials. And the big challenge, of course, to apply these in toxicology is where do we get that evidence on flaws in observational and other studies of exposures? But once we've got these priors. So here's that result, uh, uh, the meta epidemiological study. I could re represent that result as a distribution for the amount of bias I would expect due to this flaw. And now if I just pop back, just for the sake of um, maybe familiarity, th these are the, the, the poorer studies of breast cancer screening. And suppose I just wanted to focus on the first result there. The result of that study is represented by um, a distribution. Um, if we were Bayesian, this could be the posterior distribution for the result of that study. And the idea is we take that result, we think there's about this much bias, so we subtract a term for bias that has this distribution, and we end up with an adjusted result for that individual study uh, that's shifted, in this case, towards the null because the bias, we think, is pulling things down from the null. And it's also typically flattened, so the result, um, the, the study gets slightly less weight to recognize the, our uncertainty in the magnitude of the bias. And I don't think I'll talk about that. It's not just <laughs> <coughs> so fifth approach, um, I think is going to have probably less, or potentially less, um, relevance to the toxicology field. The idea of triangulating within evidence is where, where we use the internal structure of, of the, the network of evidence we've got to both estimate biases and adjust for them simultaneously. And the, the nice example I've got of this is uh, some work that Sophia did, who's going to be leading the group this afternoon, uh, using a network meta-analysis approach. Now, network meta-analysis, many of you won't know what it is. This one. 
very, very briefly explain what it is. The idea is, is particularly applied to randomized trials, where suppose here are three treatments, catiapin, placebo, and haloperidol, in fact. And suppose we've got some studies comparing each pair of treatments. So there's a meta-analysis uh, underlying each comparison of two treatments. A network meta-analysis analyzes all of these things simultaneously while imposing the important constraint that these three bits of evidence line up or agree with each other. Uh, in other words, we're saying that the, the difference between the two drugs, haloperidol and cotypine, is, is equivalent to the difference between the two placebo-controlled comparisons of each treatment through a transitivity argument. I haven't got time to say much more. May, ma that may not make sense, but the idea is that we're, we're, we're forcing evidence to fit together. And if we do that, then these triangles of evidence uh, should hold within the good studies. And under particular assumptions about the nature of the bias, particularly that it's the, the same bias underlies different studies, the same magnitude of bias underlies different studies with the same flaw, then we might suspect that the the triangle will hold within the bad studies as well as within the good studies. And sort of bias is cancelling out. And through this argument, uh, which I'm not explained as well as Sophia would, we can estimate the magnitude of the bias and adjust for it at the same time. And there are various other ways of using the data to learn about biases and adjust for them. So multivariate meta-analysis, when we've got um, missing outcomes, can help us fill in missing outcomes exploiting the correlation with reported outcomes if we multivariately model the missing and the available outcomes. Okay, so to bring it to a close, there are a lot of methods out there that could be used under this banner of bias adjustment. Some of them target individual studies and they're probably uh, in many senses the most natural to implement because uh, it's not that common that we have a whole host of studies of the same thing that allow us to use the kind of broader level uh, <coughs> body of evidence adjustments like regression approaches. We can inform these assessments, these adjustments uh, using, well, we always make assumptions, but some of these methods are based solely on uh, assumptions and, and which are of course opinions, but these opinions could be formally elicited uh, for some of the types of adjustments from, from experts. And if we've got empirical evidence, then uh, it would be great to be able to use it. And the, the availability of empirical evidence, I think, could be an interesting topic for discussion later. So I've been billed on the hazard identification um, stream, but of course these methods are apply similarly to hazard characterization. And uh, interestingly, as I've, I've hinted, some of them allow us to learn about biases and some of them impose our beliefs or information about biases. So that's, that's all I had to say, thank you. Thank you very much. Do, do we have any questions? Uh, Holger? Thanks, Julian, that was some um, very informative. I have one, one follow-up question, maybe that's what you're gonna address in the small group, but um, um, the um, risk of bias um, adjustments based on distributions and differences, um, you showed it on one slide, um, differences between unbiased, let's say, studies and those that are a risk of bias. Um, um, in order to come up with estimates that um, are bias adjusted um, are obviously very elegant, but the problem is that you need that type of evidence. And in most situations we don't have that type, or in many situations we don't have that type of evidence. And when you have it, then you know, why adjust? Why not just use the unbiased studies? Anyways, that's just the introduction. So, so with regards to, um, um, let's just say in the context of randomized trials, um, with regards to lack of blind and concealment, loss to follow up, um, and so on, what, what do we, is there any, has there been any development? Are there any, um, um, are there adjusters that one can use to extrapolate from one question to another? Or um, are we still, you know, are we still, um, um, shooting in the dark, in a sense. So, so what's the latest um, um, on that topic? Do you know? You weren't planted, but one thing I can... So, I think for the elicited opinion, that's 
I mean, that's an approach that doesn't really need more refining. Uh, the problem is just getting the time and the right people to elicit those opinions. You're absolutely right for the data-based adjustments. We have great data for trials, um, but not for observational studies. So there's a research agenda there if we want to pursue it to collate that empirical evidence on the effect sizes, uh, how they change according to different features of observational studies uh, so that we can use those prior distributions based on other data, other similar data, to adjust results in studies that we see in, for putting into our synthesis. Uh, in terms of recent developments, this slide was just saying that we've got a project ongoing to bring together elicited opinion with data um, so that we get a bit more refinement, not just this rather generic data sets, but um, we can, this is about selecting regions of the empirical distribution um, that, so we think this study is particularly bad, so it's gonna be in you know, region D of the distribution, and then for putting that into the, um, uh, using that to form the prior to adjust. Daniel? Danielle Wyckoff, Talk Strategies. Thank you very much, that was, that was good. Could you potentially say a little bit more about which approaches might be most applicable for the toxicology field based on what you've seen, knowing that we have very heterogeneous data sets, often not enough data do, to do a meta-analysis, uh, and, and typically lacking in that empirical data? I think because of the diversity um, uh, and and particularly fitting in with the response service ideas of not having l many replicants of the same sort of thing, but putting other things together. I think the, the, the study level adjustments are likely to be uh, the most uh, useful. Um, the opinion-based ones are ready to go. You know, you just sit someone down with the study and ask what they think about the amount of bias. But that's gonna be very problematic, putting such subjectivity into um, you know, these big decisions about whether things are uh, hazards. Um, I mean, it is, of course, the topic of you know, four hours discussion later <laughs> in the day. Um, so I think that's the way to go. I think it'd be great if we can think carefully about what data we might use to inform those prior distributions. So that's one area. And the other area where I think uh, the examples I showed were direct adjustments for particular flaws, doing multiple sensitivity analyses about, well, what likely degree of confounding might there be? Uh, or, or what's the impact of loss to follow-up, or what's the impact of misclassification in this study. Uh, I think the, those few examples I've found are, are exemplars for what could be done there. Thank you. One more question. Please? Please, yes. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, I wondered why you didn't uh, talk about yet another approach, uh, which is just assume that the bias, well, different studies have different levels of bias, some of them big, some, uh, some of them smaller, and just consider this as a random factor and add an additional error term in your statistical model at the level of the study, and just include it in, the, in, the, in your statistical model, because then you are not that subjective, uh, subject to all those rather subjective assumptions. Absolutely, and that, uh, so the idea of using a random effect to allow for uh, biases involves quite a strong assumption that they average to be zero. Uh, I think the only reason I didn't put it in is because it doesn't really adjust in any way. It, does, it involves no shifting of results uh, directly. No, but that is not needed because you are interested in, well, the assumed true average of all those studies, and this is only an error term, so it doesn't really, then it doesn't, so you, cha you uh, uh, translate the bias into a random term. Absolutely. So if you're willing to uh, assume the bias is uh, average at zero, then you don't need to worry about bias adjustment, but you want to worry about appropriately accounting for the, the spread of results and not overinterpreting that heterogeneity as real variation, uh, sort of removing the biases from the variability that you think there is about the exposure effect. But I mean, that's a, yeah, I could have included that. Thank you very much. So we're moving on to the uh, next lecture and it's a pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Professor Steen uh, Van Stillant. I hope I pronounced that right.
um, uh, we're exceptionally happy to see that uh, um, Steen was able to make it to the uh, to the colloquium. And uh, his uh, lecture is going to be on quantitative approaches to combining evidence across evidence stream. So uh, Dr. Van Stilad comes to us from University of Ghent, uh, where he's a professor of statistics uh, in the Department of Applied Mathematics, Computer Science, uh, and Statistics at Ghent University, and professor of statistical methodology in the Department of Medical Statistics at the London School of Hygiene and uh, Tropical Medicine. And uh, his research is primarily concerned with statistical methods for inferring causal effects from observational data, which is a very interesting and contested area. Thank you very much, you're welcome. Thanks very much for the invitation and the nice introduction. I'm going to take um, in this talk a bit of an, I think a critical look by an outsider on um, combining evidence across different uh, evidence streams. And this is a joint work with a PhD student at Ghent University. So let me just start with a brief overview. When we aim to assess risk to human health from exposure to chemical substances in the environment, then we often get to see evidence from a variety of sources. It could be different study designs, like we may have evidence from randomized experiments as well as observational studies, or we may even have evidence from both animal and human research. And then the question is, can we somehow synthesize the evidence across these different studies? Um, I have a nice example here, going back to uh, an older paper by Peters and others, where they have data on human studies, five human studies, or five studies in humans, eight studies in animals, um, in particular, some studies looking at rats as well as rabbits. And so the, again, the question is how can we combine the evidence across these different studies? Of course, the obvious way to do that would be to make use of meta-analysis approaches. Uh, in the most simple case that would work, for instance, by averaging logot ratios from the 13 different studies where we, where we may assign weights to the different studies proportional to the precision of the estimates that we obtain there. Or we may even um, take a more advanced look uh, that acknowledges the heterogeneity that we have between the different types of studies. So let me make that point clear. Um, so roughly you could say we have four types of studies, five looking at humans, then we have one species, another species, and yet, yet another species. So I'm going to view this as four clusters of estimates, and we may want to acknowledge that there could be heterogeneity between these uh, different types of studies. So to give you a little bit of a sense, so one way to do that would be a hierarchical Bayesian analysis, where, let me just explain the notation. So the beta ij here would be the logot ratio estimate that we have obtained from study I, um, when we look at species J, so we, J refers to the four groups of studies that we have, and I refers to which, say if I'm looking at human studies, J would be one, and then I, I have five indices I that tell me which study am I exactly looking at. So in particular, I could assume that the estimates that we have obtained from the literature vary around some truth, psi IJ, we could acknowledge that the Psi IJs differ um, within species around some common mean Theta J, and we could acknowledge that there is also heterogeneity between species. And finally, the focus would be on estimating like this common effect mu across all the studies um, that we have obtained. So by doing this, by acknowledging the different sources of uncertainty, there's uncertainty between species and, and even within species we have uncertainty, we, we can come to a more valid assessment of the total uncertainty in the data. And this is how that would look like um, for the study here. So on the bottom you can see results from a classical meta-analysis. The, the black result shows you what happens if we combine the results across all the species. The white result shows what happens if we only uh, pull results from human studies and surprisingly we see uh, tighter intervals when we look at all species combined because we have more data. But this analysis here is the hierarchical Bayesian analysis, which in fact shows the opposite because once we are explicit that there is more uncertainty between species, uh, it turns out that in fact there is less heterogeneity should we just restrict the analysis to the data obtained from studies in humans. 
So I, I think all of that makes sense to some degree, but nevertheless, I'm going to take a step back in this talk and reflect on whether we can just pull results um, from these different studies in particular. Can we just pull results from studies in humans and studies in animals? Briefly, the, the kind of question I'm going to raise is, uh, should we do this, then what are we actually inferring from the data? The summary estimate that you saw in the previous picture, which is sitting uh, over here, what is, it really, what is really the meaning of this? Um, can we somehow interpret it as the effect of THMs on, low, on the risk of low birth weight in humans? Are we talking about a population of humans and animals combined? If, if this is referring to humans, what kind of humans are we talking about? Are we looking at particular ages, particular genders? All of this is a, is a little bit um, implicit here. So I'm going to talk about this. I'll do this first by focusing on uh, cross-design synthesis. So how can we synthesize results from different study designs, only looking at humans? So I'm going to make life a little bit simpler. And hopefully that will give insight. Uh, so I'll talk ab about some complications, even if all the studies look at humans. Hopefully that will give insight in the more complex problem, how we can synthesize evidence from human and al animal studies. So the two kind of studies I'm going to focus on is just randomized experiments on the one hand, observational studies on the other hand. Suppose we have data from both sources and we want to combine them. Randomized experiments, as we know, are gold standard if we want to infer the effect of exposures on risk of adverse events. We have comparable groups of subjects um, that enables fair comparisons. That's all known to you. But I, I do want to emphasize that the other nice thing uh, about randomized experiments is that they allow us to get very simple results. We can report the risk of adverse events in people with the exposure. We can report the risk of adverse events in people without the exposure. This is very easy to communicate and to report. I'll come back to this point later on. Observational studies are of interest as well. They usually focus on study populations, for instance, which may be of greater interest, which are more uh, resembling the kind of populations we want to uh, really do interventions on, say. But of course, they have the drawback that we have no guarantee of compatible exposure groups. And this is why typically we would collect data on confounders, pre-exposure characteristics. The idea being that if we compare people with the same characteristics, some being exposed, some not being exposed, well then hopefully that would be a more fair comparison. Often we will not know what all the confounders are and even if we do know, uh, we might not have data on all of them. So that affects the quality of observational data analysis. And that goes back to the previous talk to some extent. So sensitivity analysis uh, as Professor Rubin pointed out, are very important, or we may want to look at alternative approaches that do not demand data on confounders, such as instrumental variables. But the point I want to make is that as we start to analyze observational studies, we typically focus on different effect measures than we would normally report if we were to analyze randomized experiments for two reasons. So. One point is that even, as I said, in randomized experiments, we can just simply report the risk of adverse events in the exposed and the unexposed. But in observational studies, we usually report something like an odds ratio or a hazard ratio because we want to adjust for confounders. And that leads us to these more complicated association measures, which I think uh, personally are, are, are difficult to report. And I'll, I'll get back to this in a moment. So one of the things I'll attempt to do is see if in a meta-analysis we can somehow avoid this and, and focus on easier to communicate effect measures. The other point is that in randomized studies, we usually report population level effects, um, namely what is the risk of adverse events in the whole population that was exposed and what is the risk of adverse events in the whole population that was unexposed. But in observational studies, we usually report subgroup effects. If we report odds ratios, they would usually express what is the effect of exposure on outcome in people of a given age, of a given gender, from a given region, and so forth. Uh, these are subgroup effects. And you may wonder if we can just simply pool these population level effects with these subgroup effects, which have clearly a very different meaning. Pooling those, in fact, turns out to be very subtle and turns out to be 
uh, difficult, especially without ratios, because of uh, a phenomenon known as non-collapsibility, which is a sort of dilution effects. And I've attempted to illustrate this with um, an artificial table taken from a paper by Sandra Greenland. So maybe we can start looking at the bottom. So here you can see data on the association between vitamin D and heart disease on the one hand in sedentary adults as well as active adults. In both cases, it amounts to an odds ratio of 2.67. There is no confounding in the example. In both um, sedentary adults, we have 500 people with low and high vitamin D consumption or, or, or level. Same in active adults. There's really no difference in terms of vitamin D exposure between both groups. But if we combine the two groups into one table, the odds ratio goes down to 2.25. And that's because over here we're looking at a more heterogeneous population where the effect tends to get diluted uh, as opposed to looking at more homogeneous sets of people. That has uh, implications. In fact, to some extent, I think this is problematic for two reasons. It hinders a good appreciation of the public health impact of, ex of certain exposures when we report them as odd ratios or hazard ratios. Personally, I do wonder if we really uh, can appreciate well how bad is an exposure with an odds ratio of 1.2, knowing that the, the magnitude of odds ratios changes as you go from homogeneous groups of people to heterogeneous groups of people. In fact, on Sunday, Mikkel Hernan tweeted that one day scientists will look back and wonder why statisticians or epidemiologists spend decades reporting hazard ratios and not absolute risks. And I think a very similar comment could be made for odds ratios. So again, the, what I'm going to attempt to do in just a moment is to see if we can um, come to reporting simpler effect measures than this. The other point is I think um, this all makes the business of meta-analysis a, a bit subtle and tricky. If we pool log odds ratios obtained from different populations with different degrees of heterogeneity, um, can you really understand it knowing that um, the degree of heterogeneity really influences the magnitude of those log odds ratios. Um, so let me give you two specific examples that link to this. Suppose that I want to synthesize results of two randomized experiments. One is looking at individuals age 20 to 30. The other is looking at individuals age 20 to 60. Suppose the two populations are really very similar. In fact, in both studies, the odds ratio of exposure if we look at individuals of exactly the same age, uh, would be the same. Even so, if I'm going to look at this study, um, the population level of ratio is going to dilute a bit and it's going to dilute, dilute even more if I look at the broader age range. So at, a, at the broader level of, the, of these whole populations, we will see differences in the, the results from the two studies. And that raises the question if we can just pull the results from these different studies. And if we do, then for what population are we really describing the effects? Is it for individuals age 20 to 30? Is it for individuals age 20 to 60? Is it for a mix of both? I think summary effects can be, uh, can be a bit unclear what population we really uh, are inferring the effect for. Similarly, if we synthesize results from observational studies and randomized experiments, as I said before, Observational studies often report adjusted associations. They look at small subgroups, and in small subgroups, you may well tend to see stronger effects. Can we just pull the results across these studies, looking, uh, noting that they look at very different effect measures? So summary for now is that um, standard approaches to meta-analysis pull results from different studies, but I think they're somewhat silent about how to interpret these summary results in particular for what population do they describe the risk of adverse effects with or without exposure. The point I made is that in more heterogeneous populations, we may often see weaker effects because of dilution, and that can make the results from different studies difficult to pool, uh, especially when those studies differ in their degree of heterogeneity or when they adjust for different variables. So what can we do about this? Um, I'm going to suggest one approach um, that we are considering in, in the context of evidence synthesis. Um, and the approach, in the approach, we'll try to be very clear about what population we attempt to infer the exposure effect for. 
So I'm going to use as an illustration the example where we have data from two randomized experiments, one looking at people aged 20 to 30, the other looking at people aged 20 to 60. Well, then my aim might be to infer what the risk of adverse events would be for those participants in the first experiment, so those who were aged 20 to 30. What would it be if they were all if they were all exposed, or what would it be if none of them were exposed to the chemical substance that we are evaluating? I think if we could do this, this would be very easy to interpret because I'm trying to be clear about what population are we talking about. Um, and I'm just going to present two risks. What is the risk if you are exposed? What is the risk if you're not exposed? I think that would be simpler to interpret than an odds ratio, for instance. If we can infer this, then well, back actually what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to attempt to use data from the different studies to evaluate exactly that same effect. And because I'm evaluating the same effect fr with the data from the different studies, I can pull them because it's clear exactly what I'm, what I'm trying to pull. How can we do this? Well, let me give you an impression. Again, my aim is to use, I'm going to show you how we can use the data from experiment two to infer what the risk of adverse events would be for those participants of experiment one if they were all exposed. So I'm really trying to, as in a meta-analysis, I'm trying to learn from the other experiments to improve my inferences for um, people in experiment one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the data from experiment two to build a prediction model for the risk of adverse events in function of exposure, in function of um, baseline covariates that I have available for the subjects in the study, in particular baseline covariates that capture differences between studies, such as age. The age was very different in my two experiments because one was looking at people aged 20 to 30 and the other was looking at people aged 20 to 60. So I'm going to use a prediction model. I think this links a bit to Professor Rubin's uh, notion of response surfaces, where we try to see how the relations look like between Z, which could be age, exposure, and then the outcome. We built this model based on data from experiment two. I can use it then to make predictions for those people in experiment one as if they were exposed, because I'm trying to learn what would happen if they were all exposed. And then those predictions I can just average across the subjects that we have seen in experiment one. So but using the ages that we have obtained for people in experiment one, I can make predictions and then we can average those. I'll show you a visual illustration of this in just a moment. We could also do this in observational studies, provided that we additionally adjust for confounding. And all of this is available in a lot of software such as STD reg in R or TFX in Stata. So just a brief summary for now. Um, this notion is in fact a very old idea. It's called direct standardization in ep epidemiology, but we can use it here to map results from different studies onto the same effect measure, such as what would be the risk for the individuals that we observed in study one if they were all exposed to the chemical substance. Because we use the results from the different studies to infer that same quantity, what is the risk for those people in study one, I can meaningfully pull the results from the different studies. But even then, there's a couple of caveats. The drawback is that we need individual data. I'm really thinking about, in the ideal situation, what might we want to do. In particular, I need data on prognostic factors of outcome, which explain how different people from the different studies are. And of course, uh, that can be difficult to find, especially when combining animal and human studies, it can be really tricky to transport results between studies in this way. Even if we could measure all of these prognostic factors that explain how different people are in one study versus the other, there's the obvious danger of making extrapolations and I'll, uh, I'll make this explicit with a, a couple of pictures. So let's go back again to the example. We have two randomized experiments. One is looking at a broad age range, 20 to 50, say. The other is looking at a more narrow age range, 20 to 30. You can immediately see the issue of extrapolation. We can't use the data for people in experiment one to sort of infer what would be effect for people in experiment two because um, 
we have very different ages in experiment two. I'm going to do the opposite for that reason. So I'm going to show how we can use the data for the black people, those in experiment two, to infer what would happen to people in experiment one. Obviously, we can see what happens to people in experiment one, but in a meta-analysis, I also want to use the other data to learn about what would happen to the red people. How do we do this? Well, direct standardization means we build a, a prediction model fitted using the black people. And I'm going to use this to make predictions for the red people. And then the idea would be that we average those predictions to learn about what would happen to the red people. You can see that there's a bit of extrapolation, in fact, in this age range, because we have very few black people. Um, we make extrapolations, uh, especially in this range. You can see that the predictions are all higher than the observations. And that's, of course, uh, the whole issue of extrapolation. We can accommodate this by working with a more flexible model, which would give us better predictions. But, of course, the downside is that based on the data, we, it's very difficult to distinguish which of the two models is suitable because we have very few black points in this range. This is where propensity score methods uh, come in, and I'll, I'll say a few points about this in a moment, but maybe I should just check the time. How much? Okay, thanks. So the point I want to make clear here is that it's very easy to extrapolate when we uh, do this kind of a meta-analysis because we may be combining results from very different kinds of people. Um, if we do this, then issues of slight bits of model misspecification can really create a lot of bias. The whole point I want to make is that if we want to transport results from one study to the other, which I think we're always doing in a sense in meta-analysis, we can really only learn from people in the different studies that are similar, that have the same measured characteristics. If it's difficult to find such people, then we're making extrapolations. And so you can have models that fit the data well, but still give severe bias. I think this is ignored by the previous standardization approach because it just relies on the outcome model being correct. But I think it's also somewhat ignored by current approaches for meta-analysis because they pull results from different studies without uh, paying a lot of attention, I think, to the characteristics of the people in the different studies. As I said, this is where propensity score methods can be useful. Again, suppose that we aim to use data from experiment one to learn what would be the risk of adverse events for people in experiment one, if they're all exposed. Well, then we could make a slight twist to the previous standardization approach. In fact, what we can do is when fitting the prediction model to the data, we can assign weights to people depending on how likely it is for them to belong to study one versus study two. I'll just give a visual illustration of this. So we can assign weights to the black people, uh, giving large weights to those people in the range of the, where the red people are. Uh, there's a few points here that you can't see very well, but. So we're downweighting the points in this region because they're not very informative about what happens there. And so I can do like a weighted prediction model which um, puts more stress on the data points in the region where we want to make predictions. And then the predictions would be more in line with where they have to be. Um, so that's, um, so briefly by including propensity scores in the analysis, we can somewhat avoid extrapolation by relying less on outcome regression, but relying more on propensity score models, models for the probability of belonging to a given study based on your age, for instance. That would typically give larger standard errors, but it's at the same time a more honest reflection of the fact that we may be making extrapolations uh, when we do this kind of analysis. I believe that the concern about extrapolation becomes really severe when we synthesize data from human and animal studies. Ideally, for this approach, we would need characteristics for both animals and humans, such that we can somehow trust animals and humans with the same characteristics to have the same risk of adverse events. Uh, like we may 
we may want to assume that it's um, at the same gender and at the same percentile of age, um, um, animals and humans uh, have the same risk of adverse events, which I think is a very strong assumption to believe. I think what current approach is the approach I suggested in the beginning, are rather assuming that the dose response relationship can somehow be transported from animals to humans. Uh, but I think also this is a bit of a dangerous undertaking, given what I said, that the magnitude of odds ratios is also very much dependent on how much background heterogeneity there is. So let me just uh, summarize here. I think pulling results from animal and human studies um, just by taking weighted averages of the results from the different studies, as in a meta-analysis, I think is a bit of a dangerous business. Um, the existing approach has acknowledged that there could be heterogeneity between animal and human studies, but in my opinion, it's not so clear what exactly they infer when they combine the results from these different studies. Um, and I also think um, they tend to ignore the dangers of extrapolating from one study to the other. I think I've attempted to point out that even if we have data from only randomized experiments, there's a, a big danger of extrapolating from one study to the other. And of course, that becomes only worse when combining animal and human studies. Regardless of how we want to move forward, I think there's a real need to be more explicit about what exactly are we aiming to infer from data when we do a meta-analysis, and exactly what assumptions are we making when we synthesize animal and uh, human data? How, what assumptions in terms of uh, what relationships that we observe for animals can be transported to humans. What exactly are, are we assuming? Thanks very much. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. Actually, I have a question. Uh, have you uh, have you thought about um, or do, do you know about uh, any work that uses modeled evidence that helps to bridge those differences between the animal and human data, such as PBPK map modeling for for exposure? Sorry, what work that uses? Uh, P uh, so some modeling, modeling prediction of exposure that helps uh, helps bridge those differences between the animal and human data. Um, I must say I'm, I'm very new to this. So um, I've seen some work recently in vaccine studies by um, groups in uh, Seattle where they're trying to do bridging studies. In some way, I think what they were doing is very very similar to what I was suggesting, that they, they, they would use, they would fit prediction models um, to the animal data to relate outcome to animal characteristics, but then see if they can find similar characteristics in humans so that they can transport the results there. And they tend to combine this with sensitivity analysis approaches, uh, but I'm, I'm sure I've only seen like a small part of what may be out there. There is some work on using PBPK pharmacologically based uh, pharmacokinetic models, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that could be an interesting piece here for yeah. you, you to try. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, please. Um, I'll just thank you for that interesting talk. I'll just make a slight comment here. You know, the problem, we, we understand that meta-analysis is all about weighted averaging. 